The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. At this point, there should be little doubt about the existence of ghosts, given millions of eyewitness reports over thousands of years. Nevertheless, science and the mainstream press seem unwilling to give up on efforts to debunk and discredit such stories. On that account, I was glad to hear from our guest today, Jenny Deason Copeland, and that she was submitting a master's thesis on the subject and how psychics do what they do. Jenny Copeland is an award-winning author and Nixon historian who holds B.A. degrees from the University of Toledo and Sedona University. She and her husband, Charles, live in a haunted house and started Crazy Redhead Publishing, CRHP, in 2015. Their first game, Saki, was a Mensa Mind Games 2019 finalist. A Mousekeeper Christmas won the best children's Christmas book of 2017, from Best of Los Angeles. CRHP is transforming Jenny's dozen or so screenplays into books with the occasional side project for friends with incredible books. Jenny holds four U.S. patents on location services, and in her previous 40-year-plus career, she was an engineer project manager for AT&T. Jenny, welcome to NDE Radio. Oh, Lee, thank you for having me. What a, what a pleasure. Well, it's... it's uh, a pleasure to have you, and it's also uh, a pleasure to to um, talk about ghosts because uh, it's a favorite topic of mine, and I don't get that many people who come on with that uh, with that kind of background. But speaking of background, Jenny, your background in publishing and engineering doesn't seem to uh, fit the type of doing a master's thesis on psychic phenomena. So how did how did you get interested in the paranormal? Uh, well, I was always interested in the paranormal and then got kind of waylaid in my education. My undergraduate degree was in uh, research psychology on child development research. And uh, from that, I went into neuropsychopharmacology at the University of Louisville in research as well. And I was studying the effects of on male mice aggression patterns, uh, withdrawing uh, them, how they react when they withdraw from, from morphine and the changes in their aggression patterns. And really didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. So after writing that thesis for about three months, decided to I, I should go work as an engineer for AT&T. Now, <laughs> I, I don't know how this path wound the way it did, but for some reason, when I uh, was facing retirement, um, I said, well, why don't I take all these screenplays that I've been writing and pitching to Hollywood executives just to hear them say, why don't you make it a book first? Why don't I start turning them into books? And I thought, well, I need to make you know, my studies now that I'm free, I'm retired now a whole year, what am I going to do with all this time? And the first thing I decided to do was take all the hundreds of books that I've read on ghosts and paranormal things, because that was my real interest all along, reincarnation, and and see what I could do um, to advance my degree before I write the next 16 books. I would like to have that PhD behind my name. So one of my friends had gotten into... Um, the University of Sedona, and she was taking classes on philosophy, and her interest tends to be uh, in wellness training. And uh, I asked her, I said, how did you do this in such a short time? And she told me, I said, well, if you can do it at 73, I can do it at 66. So I took <laughs> off on that avenue a, a year ago, and I now am a reverend if I wanted to be one. I have a degree in ministry from University of Sedona. But my real interest is in explaining the things that I have experienced to other people. When I tell my ghost stories to my friends, I get everything from, well, what am I going to say? She's crazy or just accept it because it's Jenny and, you know, she's my friend. So I'm not going to lock her up as crazy. Maybe these things do happen to her. And um, my husband, who is, was always a, a bit of a skeptic, um, now, having lived in a haunted house with me, uh, is is leaning towards the side of she definitely senses things that I don't. 
and accepts the fact that even the dogs and the cats were seeing the ghost and experiencing the ghost. And so he would joke when the dogs and cats in the house would react. He'd go, will you tell the ghost to leave the dogs alone? <laughs> well, well, tell us about your haunted house. I, I lived in an old farmhouse with a ghost for a while, and uh, uh, I'd like to hear about uh, how how did you first realize that your house was haunted? Well, this is my second haunted house, so I had some schooling before this house. Um, so I'm going to tell you the, the schooling I got from the first house in Gross Point Park. Um, okay. I bought the house. I was 20, what, 27 years old. Uh, with my first husband, and I had a brand new little baby. She was one year old, and we moved into a 3,600 square foot half timber brick tutor that needed had been repaired outside, but needed all kinds of interior decorating on the inside. We had when we pulled up the carpet, which was moth eaten, horsehair matting underneath. We would find the treasure that these ugly carpets were were protecting beautiful, untouched hardwood floors. Mm. So we went room by room through this house, literally updating it uh, from the pink walls, pink ceilings in the living room to, you know, a, a place someone would walk in and go, this is a lovely, you know, at the time, 1980s home. And what I didn't realize is that we were only the second family to ever live in the house. And we got stories from the neighbors, and they would tell us about the original family that had lived there. And he was an engineer at Hudson and worked on the Terraplane, a very lovely car. And he was the second owner. The first owner was a, an, an architect who was building the house for himself, lost his shirt and everything else in the stock market crash in 1928 when the house was built, never got to live in the house. So the house had features that only an architect would put in for himself. Beautifully done. And we were in there as the second family. So the first family, a man, the engineer from Hudson, raised five girls in that house. And just as a side note, one time one of the daughters drove by, saw us out in the air and said, I used to live here. This was my childhood home. Can I come through and see what you've done with it? Oh, sure. Let's give her a tour. So those kinds of things just kind of happened at this house. And my parents were so excited. Oh, one of their daughters, there were four of us, had bought this mini mansion in Gross Point Park. They had to come up to see it. So we sat mom on the picnic table watching the baby while I went out with a Polaroid. Remember those Instamatic cameras we used to oh, have yes. in the world? Yeah. <laughs> took took okay. that out on the curb, took a picture of the house, walked back, and we watched it develop. And there was there was a guy kneeling down in front of the the den window. Uh-huh. And he was in a short sleeve shirt, brown kind of dress pants, but you, his face was kind of obscure. You couldn't see his face. My mom goes, what's your dad doing out in that picture? I go, my dad wasn't in the picture. Mom, daddy wasn't in there. Well, no, I won't believe this. I go, it's our ghost. He's he's there. And kind of my mom was a half believer in ghosts. And so I knew I could always bait her a little bit. Uh-huh. That's your dad. He was out there playing his pranks. He was a, a practical joker. And I said, Mom, I'll go take another picture, and I'll have all of us lined up on the curb. You just watch the baby. So we, all of us lined up on the curb, took a second picture, went back around in the backyard, threw it on the picnic table, and watched it develop. There is the man, about three feet over, standing this time, not squatted down or kneeling, dressed the same way. Hmm. And it wasn't a spot on the film because it had moved over, right? Right. So we had two pictures of the ghost, and we knew he was there because of the chairs in the dining room moving on the hardwood floors. When no one's in the room, you could hear these things. We had a little den with a fireplace and the TV right under the baby's nursery. And we would sit there and watch TV in the evening after the baby had been put to bed. And you could hear the footsteps upstairs in her room. And I go, oh, man, this is not good. Baby's out of bed. And we'd take turns running up and down the steps to make sure the baby was in the the bed. She was always sound asleep in her crib. 
Mm-hmm. She had not gotten anywhere, but those footsteps were so constantly in her room. So had had, had this happened? Um, were you aware of the ghost before the photographs were taken? No, we we. So that we was the knew, first. Yeah, that was the first inclination oh. that he was there. Was okay. he, he showed himself to us? Um, and then, of course, all the noises um, were all there. But in old houses, we'd always kind of look at one another and go, yeah, old houses creak a lot. I go, right. those are footsteps. That's not creaking. <laughs> or there's a door closing when it doesn't usually close. Why is that happening? And it was the baby's nursery door would always close by itself when I was trying to rock her to sleep. And it was very unnerving. Yeah. Well, they, we talked to the neighbors. We said, so tell us more about this family that used to live here. And they said, well, uh, the father lived here until he was 82 years old. And he always went up north in the, in the fall, good Michigander, open, open deer season. Then people run up north with their guns and, and get their deer. And, and that's what he would do every year. He had a deer camp and he died at the deer camp, but he had told the neighbors that he would outlive the beautiful brick wall that surround the back backyard. The backyard was a sunken um, garden. In the middle was a rock garden with a beautiful bird bath. In the 1920s when it was built, it must have just been absolutely stunning. We um, heard his story and said, well, this is interesting. And they said, well, we, we want to tell you what happened. Six months after he, he, he died, that wall fell down, and he had always told us, I'll outlive that wall. Mm. And so we said, well, this guy's powerful. He's, he's, he's got some psychic abilities of his own, didn't he? So he didn't die in the house, which was kind of a good thing. But we're in there constantly being haunted by this guy. And I, I mean, just to the point where one of my girlfriends would no longer go upstairs when I was giving the baby a bath because he stood behind us one time and just freaked her out so bad. And did he was she, like breathing. How did on she sense? Bath. Oh, you're going to tell me how, yeah. how she could sense that he was there. Well, number one, both of us, um, have some psychic abilities and our hairs were on the back of our neck were standing up goosebumps and she's talking to me the whole time he's standing right behind me Jenny and I was kneeling down at the tub giving the baby a bath and she was standing up behind me and he was behind her and she says Jenny he's breathing on my neck and I go Karen he'll go he's not going to hurt us he'll, he'll go but that was it she would not go back upstairs ever <laughs> and so the two couples um, would share dinners alternating weekends we'd be at their house one week and they come to ours the next and we were just dear dear friends and still are to this day well she and and her husband gene were over for the evening and we were playing kind of a volleyball game over that wall in the backyard we didn't have a net so that was going to be our 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 makeshift net and uh, having some beers, and I needed to go in to go to the bathroom, change the baby. So I grabbed the baby and go in. And I had just seen Amityville Horror, which is not a good thing to watch if you are a good movie to watch if you're living in a, a haunted house. We were redoing the downstairs bathroom, and I kind of slammed the door behind me, put the baby on the floor. And when I shoved the door behind me, I heard the lock slip into the jam. And I go, that can't happen. All the hardware sitting here on top of the sink because we were redoing that room. Uh-huh. We had taken all the fixtures off the door. And yet just the force of me slamming the door shot the lock into the jam. Well, I was locked in this tiny little bathroom the size of most people's broom closet. Um, Gorse Point homes were huge, but the bathrooms were, were hardly big enough to turn around in. And all I had was a little jealous window that you crank open. It was six six inches wide, and there's no way I was going to get me out that window. I could have drunk, dropped the baby, you know, out the window. But what good would that have done anybody? Um, so especially I was the upset. baby. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she was crying. I said, "Well, I got to I got to get myself out of here, and I got to quit upsetting the baby." So I took the fixtures off the top of the sink, and I stuck them in the the hole in the door and jiggled them around a little bit, knowing that wasn't going to do anything. But the lock I heard slide out of the jam and back into place, opened the door, grabbed my baby, and ran back out to the back 
backyard to tell them what happened. Well, that started a conversation about ghosts. And, of course, the ex was not a believer. Well, the conversation at dinner was ghost. We tried to do an up table up thing, but of course the the ex would interfere with that process and so we weren't happy with that. So we said, well, we'll call my friend Karen's father, who is a world, decorated World War II vet. If Jack believes in ghosts, will you? They said to my ex. And he says, well, yeah, if Jack believes. So we went to call Jack on the phone to convince the ex that there is such a thing as ghosts. So we're all huddled out in the kitchen because that's where the wall phone was. At the time, they were all, phones were hooked to a house permanently in one spot. Yeah. Yes. Not in your pocket. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, our phone was dead. Well, that upset me greatly because I happened to be the manager for that central office and my group was responsible for its well-being. So I had the ex run over to the neighbors, make sure that the phone, their phones are working or I need to call somebody. Um, we've got a huge outage here in an area that included the president of Michigan Bell. So I was very concerned that the phones would, were or were not working. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the neighbor's phone was fine, so I could calm down about that. But then we stand in the kitchen discussing why is our phone dead and no one else's is. And we're going, it's the ghost. This is, you know, everybody but the ex. It's the ghost. And he goes, there's no such thing as ghost. And he said it three times. And kaboom, this huge blue ozone smelling ball of electrical lightning stuff went off in my kitchen sink. Whoa. The lights went dead. And the next words are my ex going, oh, we just blew a fuse. (laughs) <laughs> we had blown a hundred fuses in this house, and nothing had ever happened like that. So he gets the fuse replaced, comes back out to the kitchen where the rest of us are, are going, Gary, please do not say that again. Say what? There's no such thing as ghost? Yeah, that. Stop saying it. What? There's no such thing as ghost? He said it the third time, and kabammy, blue ball, three foot ball of electrical ozone smelling lightning goes off in my sink again wow lights go dead next sound i hear is the back door slamming after my friend said call us if you're still alive in the morning (laughs) (laughs) it never happened again but that right there made me a firm believer now the story continued i'm upstairs rocking the baby to sleep This is a week or so later, maybe two weeks later, and I'm now pregnant with a a second child, and we always left the light in the hall on and the lights in the bedroom, her nursery, off to try to get her to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So I have her in arms, rocking her, and that doggone bedroom door starts to close all by itself. And that just gave me the goosebumps. I'm getting them again as I'm telling you the story. <laughs> gave me those goosebumps and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. And I get up and I open the door again. And it happened a couple times. And finally, I'm looking down the hall and I sense that he's going to show himself to me. And I, I start talking to an empty hallway. I'm going, sir, this is no longer your house. We're just redecorating it. Please understand that I am pregnant with another baby. If you show yourself to me, you're going to scare this baby right out of me. you got to leave me alone. Now, go out. Go away. Leave our house. It's our house now. It's not yours. And I said it three times. Go away. It's not your house now. It's ours. Go away. My girlfriend came the next weekend because we always traded back and forth, you know. She was there about 15 minutes in the house, and she said, how did you get him to leave? Ah, so she detected that he had actually left. Exactly, and I said, I just asked him to leave, Karen, and he was gone. Now, where where do you suppose he went? Well, my studies say that um, when someone passes, they, they enter the astral plane, and there are different levels on the astral plane. And sometimes 
a person is so connected to a place like this home where this man had raised his family that was his his home that was his place on earth he was very stuck there and even though he was dead and had been for years he preferred to stay there and protect the home rather than move on into the other levels of the astral plane where he could be with other spirits and it's called being stuck and so what i had done was woke him up to the idea that he needed to move on needed to go into his death deeper than he had and take his spirit to another level on the plane and leave the earthly plane the material plane alone that that's not where he needed to abide right now and it, it's some one one lady <laughs> wrote an interesting book called Suddenly Psychic. And it's literally one of the duties of a psychic if confronted by a spirit to, to help them move on, to help them go to the other levels of the astral plane and not stay here in the material world any longer because it's, it's doing no one, including their spirit, any good at all. Right. So when I meet them, my goal is always to um, move move them on, explain to them that they are dead, that they're not here of this earth anymore, and they, they do need to go find what their their next spirit journey should be, but to leave the material world alone for now. Do you now, think some, some Do you think ahead. some ghosts are um, not confused, but fully aware that they should move on, but choose to hang around anyway of their own free will? Yes, and spirits can come back if they think someone that they love or care about might be in trouble guardian angels do exist they will come back to help you people who are deceased do pay attention to the folks here on on the material plane Mm -hmm. and there is a connection and they my my dad passed 30 plus years ago and he's come back to me a couple times um and it's always been and it's just a supportive helpfulness that he always was and he, there's just no doubt in my mind that's dad yeah. and he's coming back to to help me th- in that trying time do you think that connection interferes with um reincarnation or do you think it's possible to be in two places at once well some people say there is a possibility to be in two places at once i i just think it's um there are cases where the same spirit has dwelled at the same time on earth in two different bodies which are rare but um so who am i to say what all the possibilities might be right uh there are tons and tons of ways these spirits can get in touch with us and there's um a difference good i'm glad you brought that up between spirits and ghosts uh ghosts are um here dwelling usually fixed in a spot not knowing they're dead, where a spirit does know that they are are dead and choose to be here and communicate with us for a purpose. Um, I am not a medium. I don't go out there and try to call a ghost to me or Aunt Judy or whoever and pretend to have some kind of connection with any any spirit that might be out there. Spirits contact me. I don't contact them. Uh, they know that I'm capable of having um, a communication with them, and when there's a need, they talk to me. The person in the that spirit I met here in this house, it's, I'll give you a little history of this one. The land was purchased from the Northwest Territory in 1826. When they came through for the first Michigan State Census, in 1837, Mrs. Harris lived here with a parcel of children. So we don't know the exact age of the house. We just knew that sometime in those 11 years, a house was here and inhabited by a family. Mm-hmm. So the house is about 190 years old. When I went through it, the real estate people had named the house the Silence of the Lambs House. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, I'm taking my first walk through the I'm house. I'm sure they didn't market it that way. <laughs> no, but they joked with one another, you know, uh-huh. and I found this out later because one of the engineers at work had also looked at the house and wanted to buy it, but it was just more work than he and his wife with two, two little, little, little babies could possibly do. And so I went through the house the first time 
and it had everything I wanted in a house. I had told her old farmhouse, many fireplaces. I love fireplaces. And a, and a attached garage. Well, I didn't get the attached garage, but she hit it on every other note. Old farmhouse, fireplace in the kitchen, fireplace in the master bedroom, fireplace in the in the living room, hand hewn beams. I mean, you just couldn't ask for a more country farmhouse house in the middle of a city than this one. And it was only two miles away from work. And I had been driving 92 miles one way south of Toledo up here to, to um, Southfield, Michigan to work mm-hmm. for six years. And I did that because I promised my children I wouldn't move them again until they were graduated from high school. Well, they were both graduated. I had the house on the market for 18 months. Here I am looking at this place. I fell in love with it. And as I'm doing that first walkthrough, I asked the realtor if she wanted to come down into the basement with me as I toured the basement. Oh, no. Oh, no. I've seen it. You go ahead. She would not even come down in the basement. Mm. So I come down here and, and into the basement, and it's these uh, beautiful field rock basements that, you know, old farmhouses always had, just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Hand-hewn beams that, if you knock on them, feel like they're concrete. I think they're petrified now. And there was this other part of the, the basement that was had, had a door, and it had a drill bit holding the door shut. And I removed the drill bit, opened the door, to find just cobweb haunted house, perfect setting. Bare bulb, string, dirt floor. I pull the, reach through the cobwebs, pull the string, and walk into this dirt floor part of the basement. And there it was. There was a cistern. That's how it got its name, the Silence of the Lambs basement, was one of those old cisterns that they used in homes that were part of the Underground Railroad. They would funnel the water off the roof down through a gutter system into the cistern to store water so that the federal marshals could not see how much water they were actually using. Because if you were using too much water, that would give the federal marshals an excuse to come in and look through your house and see if you were harboring any escaped slaves. What a lot of people don't understand, because now we we give such high regard to the people who ran the Underground Railroad, those people were felons. Jenny, were, uh, we are uh, almost out of time. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Believe it or not. Tell, tell us, uh, what was the most, uh, say, um, exciting aspect of the second house's haunting? Well, I met him. He was an escaped slave, and he told me that if I would uh, write his story, he would get me the house. And remember, the house was on the market for 18 months. Yeah. Well, the real estate, I had to put a contingency on my offer of the house, full price, but there was another offer without a contingency. So the real estate lady called me and said, hey, you're going to not get this house. And I said, you call me when that deal falls through, not if, when. Two weeks later, she calls me says, Jenny, the other deal fell through. And I said, I knew that. <laughs> she says, can you remove your contingency? I said, I don't have to. My house sold. In two weeks, ah, he had sold good. my house. You had mentioned something about uh, needle and thread. Was that oh, falling goodness. from the ceiling? Yes, that was. Um, was that this house? That was this house. One Christmas, okay. my daughter was here. And a wooden spool of thread and a rusty with a rusty needle stuck through it, fell from the ceiling while she was laying in bed reading a book. And she came out to the kitchen where I was cooking and says, Mom, what's this? And I go, I have no idea. Where'd you find that? She says, it just fell from the ceiling. (laughs) But uh, uh, it's interesting that the slave, I mean, you wouldn't think a slave would want to stick around in in a house on the on the Underground Railway, but I, by the way, owned a farmhouse just like that with a uh, with a cistern, a rainwater cistern. It was their only source of water, and uh, also a ghost. But we are out of time, unfortunately, for today. Uh, Jenny, how if people want to get in touch with you or find out more about uh, Crazy Redhead Publishing, how would they do that? Well, we have our books out there, our game, our our a Mousekeeper Christmas activity, which is supposed to de elf the shelf, 
elf, um, <laughs> do you shelf the elf, something like that, um, because we, we don't think the kids should be spied on. But you can find all of our products um, out on our books, out on Amazon. Other products are also available from www.crazyredheadpublishing.com. We have a YouTube channel. If you search on Jenny Deason, D-E-A-S-O-N, Copeland, you Copeland with an E, you yes. will find uh, all of our book trailers and a How to Play Our Game Saki all out there. Um, so those are the best ways to really um, get in, in touch with us. That's terrific. Well, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. This has been this has been really fun. I should tell the audience that for information on our upcoming IANDS conference near Philadelphia, go to IANDS.org. And if you'd like to listen to this show again or any of our past shows, go to our website at nderadio.org. And join us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening. <laughs>